Thank you, Enwa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today is a very nice day. We are celebrating a birthday, a nice uh, birthday, a happy event. Uh, it's a, a very nice age, 25. I don't remember, but it's a, it's a very nice age. So you don't have to yet to worry about the, the problems of, uh, of old age. So uh, first of all, congratulations. Congratulations to the, to the CPMI. Um, I would like to begin by, uh, in addition to congratulate you, by complimenting one of the fundamental achievements or accomplishments that probably uh, we know, but uh, uh, is not uh, publicly recognized enough times. The, the crisis that erupted in 2008 revealed that the financial sector had many shortcomings, and we know that. But the infrastructure that supports payments, clearing, and settlement was not among these uh, shortcomings. On the contrary, the various financial market infrastructure uh, withstood the, the battering that received while the markets were really in disarray and in turmoil. And they continued to function smoothly or with little or, or, no, or no damage. If in 2008 the market infrastructure had been the sa at the same state that it was back in the, probably in the 90s, then the outcome could have been uh, rather different. I think we have said many times, uh, but it is worth uh, repeating it again, that FMIs are fundamental to the ability of markets to, uh, to work. A weak infrastructure can turn a small crisis into a very large one. And uh, the fact that the infrastructure was at that point in, in 2007, 2008, um, uh, strong enough in, uh, in large part is, uh, is due, uh, is thanks to the many efforts uh, of uh, the people of this committee and of the committee. I think the introduction of improvements such as the real-time gross settlement for payments deliver versus payment for securities and payment versus payment for foreign exchange has made a real substantial differences. So I think this is, uh, this is really uh, congratulations. And I think I am, in that sense, uh, going in the same direction that Agustin was, uh, was, uh, was expressing in his, in his remarks. So in the rest of my remarks, I shall first uh, highlight three snapshots from the committee's history corresponding to the three sessions of this conference. And then I shall talk about uh, how the committee has been working in the context of what we call uh, here at the, at the BIS the, the Basel process. And finally, I would like to say just one uh, small thing about the growing role, uh, looking up, uh, to the future, about the growing role of the centralized counterparties or, or CCPs. So let me start with some history and the three sessions that we have today. I will uh, change the order of the sessions to preserve chronology. So let me start with session two. Session two is about the resilient recovery and resolution of FMIs. As I mentioned early, one of the CPMI's most uh, significant contribution is the promotion of payments versus payments as a safer way to settle foreign exchange. Many of you in this audience uh, would know better than I that the history behind this goes back to 1974 and the so-called Herstatt crisis. However, the, the truth is that in, in this, in, at the BIS, the direct consequence um, for that uh, in Basel was, in fact, the creation of the Basel Committee, not the CPSS at that, at that time. It was only after a few years that people recognized the need to, for a more specialized group on uh, settlement issues. Nevertheless, despite this uh, a little bit later start, the CPSS embraced these forex settlements as one of the initial and defining uh, projects. And with the launch of the CLS in 2002, the committee's work in FX settlements became one of the major enduring successes. Also in terms of the cooperation with the Basel Committee, both committees worked together and in 2013, recently, they produced the supervisory guidance for managing risks associated with the settlement of foreign exchange transactions. And I'm sure that in the coming years, this cooperation will bear fruits as risks are better recognized and addressed. That was session two. Let me move now to session three of the conference, which is about the disruptive innovation. And here, I'd like to refer to what might be called the prehistory uh, of, of, of this committee. 
In a way, the committee can be considered to be not 25, but 35 years old, given uh, that its predecessor, the group of experts of, on payment system, was set up in 1980. What led to the formation of that group was a major innovation that, as it happened, was highly disruptly, disruptive, namely the, conver the conversion of paper-based large value payment system to electronic ones. This was a change driven by technology, obviously, but it occurred at the time when mar financial markets were also starting to grow very rapidly in terms of size. And the combination of new technology and bigger markets led central banks to wonder, quite rightly, what the risk implications might be. And it turned out that what was relatively harmless when payments were slow and small became potentially disastrous when there were fast and large payments. Back on, in those days, banks received information about incoming payments in real time during the day and credited the customers' accounts immediately based on that information. But settlements between banks took place only at the end of the day, and the result is obvious. Large amounts of intraday interbank credit that was hardly visible, understood, or controlled by the banks. This development led to was thankfully one only a just brief period of era of electronic large value deferred settlement arrangements before real time settlements came to dominate these settlement systems. Now let me move to session one. Session one is about the evolution of a standard setting for many years some of the most influential norms in the payments and settlement area came from the report that was in effect the father of the CPSS, that is the Lanfalusi report of uh, 1990, published just uh, when the CPSS was uh, created. This report was a key response both to that uh, disruptive innovation electronic the first settlement and to the problem of Herstatt. The first reports that were issued by the CPSS itself were mainly uh, statistical in nature, very different from a standard setting. But soon thereafter, the committee started producing a wide range of uh, normative statements. Now, the terms used at that point uh, to describe these statements varies, varied enormously, but curiously, the term standards was not very frequently used. Um, it was, uh, they used uh, a very wide range of terms, principles, core principles, general principles, recommended actions, recommendations, responsibilities, propositions, or guidelines, but usually uh, not the standards. But of course, there were standards, and, and the standard role of the committee has been there for quite a significant period of time. Uh, it was recently under the initiative of Paul and, and, and Benoit that the CPSS, International Standard Setting, was explicitly uh, confirmed. So what it was happening in de facto was explicitly put in the, in, the, in the mandate. It was explicitly confirmed by the government bodies, the ECC, and the Global Economy Meeting. And uh, the CPSS de facto or, um, it became the CPMI. Now let me turn to, you all know this, so uh, let me turn to my second part of the remarks, which is uh, in this uh, birthday, uh, a lot is going to be said about the committee's accomplishments today, which have been a lot and very important. And, uh, and I think these, co these accomplishments depend uh, a lot on the hard work of the successive generations of, uh, of members and chairs and secretariats. But also, I would like to emphasize uh, the cooperation with other committees, and in particular other committees in these uh, institutions, in this institution, and that's what we call the Basel process. Basically, we use the, the, the Basel process to refer to the active cooperation among the committees and organizations hosted here by the, by the BIS, and the interaction with the BIS supporting role uh, for all of us to achieve the objective of uh, the pursuit of financial stability, and in some cases is a standard setting. Currently, six committees, there are six committees and three associations that find their homes at the BIS, and the process is based on three main features. One is synergies, the second would be flexibility and openness, 
And the third is uh, the support from the VIS itself, and each of these is relevant, differently relevant for the different committees. Now, uh, talking about the CPMI, first on synergies, um, I think the physical proximity of uh, the different BIS committees and associations facilitate contact and exchange of ideas across the different groups. In addition, these groups share a common goal of promoting financial stability, monetary stability, and it is therefore <coughs> makes sense for them to uh, work uh, together. Good infrastructure is only valuable if it is used uh, appropriately and it, therefore it's not surprising that there has been a long history of cooperation between the CPMI and, for example, the Basel Committee. And of course, uh, the CPMI and IOSCO also have a close relationship, uh, so much that over the past five years, roughly half of the CPMI's publications have been joint publications uh, with IOSCO. Indeed, it's an increasing complex uh, financial system. No committee or group can uh, expect to work by itself in isolation. Cooperation across uh, disciplines and across jurisdictions is essential. And, uh, and as it is also taking uh, in all this work a systemic perspective, a systemic approach to financial stability. And I think the CPMI should be commended for extending this cooperative spirit and systemic view uh, globally. Now, the second feature of the Basel process is flexibility and openness. The BIS-based committees are by design limited in size. This kind of setup makes uh, discussion, coordination, and cooperation easier with corresponding benefits to the quality of the uh, output. And at the same time, this uh, output can be really much larger than the size of the committees would suggest. And this is the case because they can leverage the expertise of the international community of central bankers, financial regulators, and supervisors and other uh, authorities and in contact with, always in, in good contact with the private sector. The committee's output needs legitimacy and, and if it is to be uh, effective. And international standards, standards that are agreed are not, uh, are not uh, laws. So jurisdictions have to agree to implement them, and uh, that is uh, more likely to happen if the standards are respected, not just uh, of, for the quality of the product, but also for the nature of the process by which they are produced. In this uh, respect, uh, governance, uh, governance of these institutions, of these committees is crucial. And in the case of the CPMI and other committees here in this, in this institution, um, a lot of change, a significant change came in 2009 when the, this committee and other committees started to report not to the G10 governors, as it was the traditional here in this institution, but to the global economy, which consists of governors of 30 BIS member uh, central banks. Uh, accompanying this change was an expansion of the membership of the committee itself, and both changes have made the committee more representative of the world economy and also the financial centers. There was indeed some concern at the time uh, of the expansion of the committee uh, about the effectiveness, whether this would make it less effective, and happily this proved to be a misplaced concern. Uh, the friendly and cooperative spirit of the committee has been uh, undiminished in, uh, after this enlargement. Finally, the third key feature of the Basel process is the support and interaction of, with the BIS staff, with the BIS different departments itself, and the work of the Basel-based groups is informed by uh, the research department, is informed by the um, work in the international statistics, and uh, I would say by the practical experience that the BIS gains from its uh, activities as a financial institution, as a bank. Uh, as a banking institution. Now, given the very specialized, uh, perhaps uh, some would say, I would say, esoteric nature of the CPMI work, uh, most of the interaction between the BIS and the CPMI has been on the uh, statistical support uh, that we have uh, provided. Whether the Committee Regular Statistics, which uh, is the most downloaded CPMI uh, publication, or for a very hard out uh, topics such as the uh, FX uh, survey. Um, so this is uh, a very important and we are very happy to facilitate the work of the different committees that are 
here uh, hosted by the BIS. Now let me proceed to the final part of my remarks and look to the future. I referred a moment ago to the perception that CPMI work was uh, technical, really very technical, and that uh, that perception can have uh, certainly some advantages. Uh, by focusing on technical issues, the committee members can have relatively cool-headed discussions on difficult topics without being too much impinged by political uh, considerations. But it also means that the CPMI has traditionally, traditionally has been shielded from the limelight uh, uh, in a stark contrast with other uh, of the committees that have been more exposed. But I think the financial crisis may have changed this to some extent. As I mentioned earlier, um, FMIs performed well during the crisis. Nevertheless, uh, there were lessons that need to be learned, not only for financial institutions or for other regulations, but also for FMIs. And sounder, sounder standards were proven necessary without the vast uh, support uh, public support seen during the crisis, for instance, probably uh, or surely, I would say, there, must, there would have been much more failures of banks and certainly more stress, significantly more stress in some of the infrastructures. So FM, FMIs might not have withstood uh, such uh, added stress with so little uh, damage. And uh, as we all know, FMIs have to be robust even in, in difficult crises. So in this respect, let me share a few thoughts on the growing role of CCPs. As you know, one of the important elements of the regulatory agenda to reduce systemic risk um, was, uh, was precisely to encourage the use of CCPs, not least by making the clearing of standardized OTC derivatives mandatory. Now, the benefits of the CCPs, you know better than I, are qualitatively different from the benefits of other major infrastructure changes I have mentioned. The mechanisms that were improved, uh, real-time gross settlement, uh, DVP and the PVP, removed what are, in effect, uh, unnecessary frictions in, uh, in settlement process. By and large, they removed risks that they were only due to um, poor design or poor processes. So it was really improving processes and arguably the safer infrastructure infrastructure was introduced even before uh, banks themselves fully realized what were the risks behind uh, these uh, processes. But this is not exactly the case with, uh, uh, with clearing when banks are, uh, I think in that area, banks are well aware of counterparty risks. And moreover, this risk is not merely an unnecessary friction of settlement, it is an inevitable, inevitable feature of, uh, uh, of trading. So CCPs can do a lot, both to reduce risks, for example, through multilateral netting, and to ensure that the residual risk is managed effectively by the market as a whole, and, and that's why the CCPs are potentially so valuable. However, as uh, CCPs has, have grown in prominence, as uh, there is uh, greater uh, awareness of the responsibility put on them to manage risk effectively, there has been legitimate questions, you have raised legitimate questions about whether CCPs are safe enough to cope with all this responsibility. And at the same time, competition between CCPs had brought significant additional political elements into the picture. So this is a very uh, complex in both technical and political um, uh, complex discussion. So against this background, CPMI may be moving more into the limelight. Such a move may be at some point of time uncomfortable, but uh, at least on this occasion, I think it is helpful and it is helping to ask the right questions and find probably the right, uh, the right answers. Now, the substance uh, of this will be discussed in session two, and uh, I will not say much here. Uh, you know much more about that. But uh, what the only thing that I would like to add, my last uh, reflection, is the following, that uh, high standards are certainly important, but uh, it is not uh, enough. CCP also need to be supervised and overseen with uh, rigor. I think one of the lessons is that regulation is not enough, that uh, the supervision and oversight of this institution, of all institutions, uh, are very important. So supervisors and overseers need to make sure 
that CCP managers are internalizing the social cost, economic cost, that instability in the infrastructure can entail. Again, good infrastructure is only valuable if it is used uh, properly, and CCPs cannot magically remove all the risks. Ultimately, banks themselves must be responsible for the risks they take and manage, uh, and manage them effectively. And uh, CCPs can, have, uh, can be an, of enormous help, but they by no means can, um, uh, they are not a complete uh, solution. So let me conclude uh, simply by again thanking uh, you for inviting me to this happy birthday and uh, thank you for the great work that you have been uh, doing and will no doubt will continue to do. Thank you to Benoit, to the Secretariat, to Klaus, uh, the former members and chairs, uh, Bill, Paul, um, and all that uh, are not here today. There has been a tremendous job that has been done by, by this committee, and you should be commended uh, for that. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.